wherever you're listening in the world. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Israel Cast, the podcast powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. I'm Stephen Shalowitz, first reminding you that for 120 years, Jewish National Fund USA has been the premier philanthropic movement for the land and people of Israel. While best known for planting trees in Israel, JNF USA contributes to Israeli life in so many ways, including community development in the Negev and the Galilee, preservation of heritage sites, supporting people with disabilities, and connecting high school and college students to Israel. To learn more and to see how you can contribute, visit jnf.org. Once again, jnf.org. Hope you got that. All right, as for this episode, our feature guest is a man of many talents. He's Chief Strategy Officer at Gigawatt Global, a renewable energy platform for Africa based in Jerusalem. He serves on the board of Israel Cool and the Male Film School, and was also the founder and director of Media Central, a Jerusalem project providing services for the foreign press in the region. And if that weren't enough, he is also the author of My Israel Trail, Finding Peace in the Promised Land, about his hike on Shvil Yisrael, the 800-mile Israel National Trail from the border with Lebanon to Eilat on the Red Sea in the south. He, of course, is Aryeh Green, and we warmly welcome him to Israel Cast. Aryeh joins us via Zoom from his office in Jerusalem. Lovely to have you on the program, Aryeh. Thank you, Stephen. Really, really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. Listen, we've been wanting to do this for some time right now, so I'm glad our schedules actually jive. Now, listen, as we've been saying here on the program, Jewish National Fund USA has launched a year-long campaign on reclaiming the narrative, the beauty, the inspiration of Zionism. And that's really where I'd like to start with you, Arie. So in that capacity, we want to hear about your Zionism story. And let's start uh, really by your sharing what Zionism means to you. Well, I appreciate the question. And in fact, it's a kind of question that I don't think is asked frequently enough, uh, including when I'm speaking to groups about Israel's legitimacy. Um, I remember first coming across Abba Eben's statement, which I think is as relevant today as it was when he first said it more than 50 years ago. He said, Zionism is nothing more, but also nothing less than the Jewish people's sense of origin and destination in the land linked internally, eternally with its name. And and that quote to me sums up this connection between the land and the people of Israel as the indigenous people of that land, our return to our ancestral homeland um, as a people. There's so much lack of understanding about Judaism in the world in general, thinking that Judaism is a religion, a faith community, a belief system, like Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or what have you, when in fact, as obviously you will know, that we talk about the Jewish people, the people of Israel, we are you know, much more of a civilization, a combination of, of course, religious belief and practice, but also peoplehood and the connection to our ancestral homeland and a cultural uh, um, heritage and inheritance which, which just permeates our, our being, including having our own distinctive language. And for me, Zionism is the expression, the modern expression of that three and a half thousand year history of our peoplehood and our connection to to the land. Well, we're going to talk about your Aliyah story in just a second, but I want to go back. And I mean, way back, because you're actually a direct descendant of one of the first Jewish families in America. So I want you to share your family history with us. Stephen, it's a great question. And in fact, I'd like to connect it to a conversation I had with my grandmother, um, who it's through her side of the family that I'm basically uh, a, an 11th generation American family came in 1690, one of the first Jewish families, as you said, to have come to North America. Um, but the conversation I had with my grandmother connects also to my decision to move to Israel because uh, my great, 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 great grandfather was uh, Rabbi Gershom Mendesatius who some of our viewers or listeners may be familiar with the name. He was known as the Patriot Rabbi um, because at the time of the revolution, he was the rabbi and basically I think the leader of the Jewish community in America at, the, at, at that point. He was the rabbi of the Sheriff Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese Jewish synagogue in New York. And he was uh, fervently pro-revolution. So when the British were encroaching on New York, he preached a a really pro-revolution sermon, and then took the scrolls of Torah, the Sifrei Torah, and 
locked the doors of the synagogue and led his congregation out to Connecticut in order not to live under the, the rule of the British. He ended up ending up down in, uh, in Philadelphia. He started the Mikveh Israel Synagogue down in Philadelphia and ended up coming back up to New York. And uh, in what I suppose was back then the kind of uh, expression of appreciation that today might be expressed by a, a, a president in appointing a supporter of his agenda to, to be the ambassador to the court of St. James, what have you. Um, Gershon Mendesatius represented the Jewish community at the inauguration of George Washington Federal Building in New York in 1789. So the, the history that we have is very American, but of course, as you can hear, very Jewish also. Very strong Jewish identity I grew up with, but a very strong American identity. And my conversation with my grandmother um, surrounded uh, basically a feeling that she had when I said I was moving to Israel of betrayal. She said, you're, you're betraying our American heritage. So we then had a conversation where I basically very gently asked her, well, Grandma, wh where did Gershom and Decisions was born in America, but his father, Isaac and Decisions, brought him over from London, where his father, Gershom's grandfather, um, Avraham and Decisions, had arrived in London and was remarried they were conversos or, or forced uh, uh, crypto Jews. And having come from Lisbon through Amsterdam to London, they were remarried at the Bevis Marks, Spanish and Portuguese Jews in the in London in 1720. Um, their ketuba is actually there in the archives of the synagogue there. And that's when he took the name of Ramendes Sessions. And I reminded my grandmother that our family basically walked the path of the Jewish people. Because how did they... How did they get to London? How did they get to America via Amsterdam, via Lisbon? They came from Spain. How did they get to Spain? Well, obviously in the expulsion uh, in the times of the Romans. And, and she finally made her peace with my moving to Israel in understanding that it was really coming full circle for our family as well as for the Jewish people, because that's, in essence, I suppose, what we are. It's a tribe. It's a family. It's not just a national identity. I personally love hearing stories like that because I can only trace my family back maybe four generations or so. And so to go back, as you said, 11 generations, I believe, yeah. is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's, it's like daughters of the American Revolution. <laughs> it really is. And, and so you have a sense of really being American, don't you? Without question. I mean, I, I grew up with a, as a core identity with no dilemma, no um, uh, contradiction of a very strong American identity and, and connection to America, very proud of our American heritage. I have a great, great grandfather who fought in the Civil War, and I have in my possession, I would show it to you if we were at home, his Civil War medal, and I have a picture of him on my wall wearing that medal. Um, our family is related to Chaim Solomon, who uh, financed the American Revolution. Our family is related on our family tree to Emma Lazarus, who wrote the poem of course, you know, uh, huddled masses yearning to be free. Right on the on uh, the base of the uh, the new Colossus, on the base of exactly, the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty, precisely. So, yeah, a very strong um, American identity, but a very strong uh, Jewish identity. Even though our family, for a number of generations, has been uh, Reform, not uh, not traditionally observant, um, but my family helped to start the first synagogue in America, you, uh, um, in Sheriff Israel. My family helped start the first synagogue in San Francisco, Temple Emmanuel, and Sheriff Israel there as well in the around 1860, 60 something. So, yeah. How fantastic. So let's talk <laughs> about your Aliyah story. What was that trigger for you? And then we'll get to your book, which I think is, is, is quite fascinating. What was that trigger for you, Arie, to make Aliyah? Well, um, as I said, I grew up with a strong both Jewish and American identity, but not very Zionist, not anti-Zionist, mind you. But uh, my family were, were kind of your average liberal reform family in San Francisco, uh, observing Rosh Hashanah, Hanukkah, uh, not eating bread on Pesach, but with very little connection to Israel. Um, I decided, uh, I guess towards the end of my, my first degree at Berkeley, that I couldn't decide between my first, my two loves of uh, uh, where I thought I would take my career. One was international relations, and the other was um, Jewish. I was involved in a youth group and Religio religiosity, as it were. Um, and uh, I applied to and was accepted to the Reform Rabbinical School, Hebrew Union College. And the first year of study for the Reform Rabbinical Program is in Israel, where you have an intensive experience in both Jewish identity and connection to our people, as well as, of course, Hebrew studies. 
And uh, so that's what brought me to Israel. I had not ever envisioned living abroad at all, certainly not in Israel. I came to study to be a reformed rabbi. And after an intense uh, year of uh, real immersion in Israel and everything that's, that, that, uh, that surrounds that, um, I basically decided I was no longer reform. I became more and more traditionally observant. I decided I didn't want to be a rabbi um, and returned then very soon after to my other love of international relations. And uh, yet I decided, I basically fell in love with Israel. I decided to throw my lot in with the Jewish people and now return, as we said, to our ancestral homeland after 2000 years of dispersal uh, and just wanted to join and be part of this experience of renewed sovereignty in our, in our national homeland. And that's what brought me here. Am I correct in saying you've been there 35 years? Yeah, now it's actually 30, uh, 36, 37. Oh my goodness. Okay. But who's so, counting? So double high plus one. <laughs> That's right. All right. That's well, funny. listen, speaking of Israel, I want to talk about your book, My Israel Trail, Finding Peace in the Promised Land. As I said at the top, it's about, and you've got your book right there. <laughs> I'm for those, to have it. <laughs> I'm glad that you do. For those that are watching us on video and for those that are listening to us via podcast, REA is holding up the book right now. You can buy it wherever you like to buy your books. You can get it on Amazon, et cetera. It's about your hike on Shvil Yisrael, the 800-mile Israel National Trail from the border with Lebanon up north to Eilat on the beautiful Red Sea. In the South, we have a very, very global audience. Mm. We have listeners, even in countries, as I like to say, that do not even have diplomatic ties with Israel. So we have a lot of people that are just really curious about Israel that love to travel, as I do. So yeah. talk to us about first why you went on this hike, and then really let's dive into what one can find on the hike and some of the logistics around the hike. Sure. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it because every time I speak about it, um, I end up reliving the experience to a certain extent. Isn't that the best thing about travel? Sometimes <laughs> I, I find that actually as someone that loves to travel, I find that I enjoy preparing for the trip almost as much as the trip itself and then the reflections on the trip. It's very true. Yeah. Um, and in fact, because we're doing this on Zoom, if you want, I can share some photos too. But uh, I guess that's not fair to the to our yeah, listeners let, who are not watching the video. But yeah, you, you can always go to my. <laughs> yes, go to where? Where should people go to check people out? People can photos. go to my my website at uh, myisraeltrail.com um, if okay. people want to see photos or videos or what have. All right. So go um, for it. So so first, why did you take it, and then really, oh. what can people find and expect to experience on the trail? It was, uh, well, February of 2014, I basically set out. Um, I, and as you said, it's an 800-mile hike. I did it solo uh, over the course of two months, nonstop, all alone, with, uh, with a 50-pound pack on my back. You can imagine it was something of a challenge for uh, a casual hiker at age 50. I mean, I did it at age 51, not at uh, 21, which is the usual cohort of the, the hikers in the Israel Trail, post-army kind of, yeah, it used to be a thing for Israelis after they do their national service or their army service to go and hike in uh, South America or go off to, to India. It, there are still those who do it, but it's become very popular to hike the Israel Trail. But I was not 21. I was 51, and I basically spent eight weeks, 12 to 15 miles a day, um, alone with my thoughts. Uh, and basically, it was, I was looking to heal. Um, from uh, basically just a few weeks uh, after uh, my devastating divorce, a uh, divorce that I hadn't looked for. It turned my world upside down. I was angry. I was frustrated, um, full of resentment, mostly sad and, and really in pain. And the truth is, alone with my thoughts, hiking day after day through the desert, uh, as well as the mountains in the north and the hills of Jerusalem, I, I really experienced a, a transformation of sorts, kind of developed a a somewhat unique perspective uh, on our history, on our people, on the vistas and the nature of the Holy Land. And, and that's one of the reasons I love talking about it, not just reliving it, but especially with you and with the JNF as kind of the, the, the sponsor and background of our conversation. You know, what is the JNF except the foremost institution that's promoting issues related to the land of Israel, preserving the land of Israel, beautifying the land of Israel, appreciating the land of Israel, um, and uh, you know whether it's with reservoirs or forests or 
or uh, or what have you. Um, but that basically is uh, is the story of the of the beginning. And I can only say I I I really did um, have a uh, transformative experience when I, I meditated on mountain tops. I cried in dry creek beds. Uh, I wrote anguished journal entries, composed songs to lift my, my spirits. I looked back and inward and up to the night sky and over the valley to the next, next mountain range and down at the ants in the dirt and back along the trail um, to see how far I'd come. I basically discovered on the trail kind of a renewed sense of self, a sense of personal but also national history. And, uh, and a perspective of sorts uh, on the human condition. That's kind of the best way I could put it. So you would say that it was a cathartic experience for you overall? Absolutely. It, right. was, it was more than cathartic. It was healing. And it was, it was uh, um, I would say, even, I use the word transformative, but I mean, it, it was life transforming. It really did enable me uh, to use a kind of a funny phrase of getting back on the path of life it enabled me to, to find my, my way forward. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight the book was not only to share your own very personal story, which you just did, and thank you for that, but also because, again, people, when they think of Israel or they go to Israel, they go to all the historic sites, and definitely they should, and the archaeological yeah. sites, and, of course, the gorgeous beaches of Tel Aviv and experiencing the food. Yeah. But there is just such tremendous nature and beauty in the land of Israel. And yeah. can you just highlight a little bit for us, Arie, some of those high points for you, if you will, just from a natural perspective of Israel and some of the things that maybe some of our listeners might enjoy on the trail? Well, it's funny because people sometimes ask me, which you haven't asked, um, what was my favorite, favorite part of the trail? Listen, and, I try and ask questions that no one else asks. <laughs> and that you've done already, and I'm sure you'll continue to do. But it's kind of funny because um, you're, you're asking me to, to offer a few highlights enables me to, to pinpoint a few elements, which I do think are distinctive. Um, hiking anywhere in the world in beautiful scenery you know, is something that's uh, obviously enjoyable. I grew up in California. So I spent a lot of time hiking the Sierras, Yosemite. Some of our listeners and viewers may be familiar with. Obviously, around uh, the world, there are beautiful vistas. Um, but it's interesting because within the context of hiking in Israel, um, hiking, for instance, in the, the, the desert of the Negev is not just a contemplative, quiet, silent, sometimes overwhelmingly, but, but also somewhat liberating and, and peaceful experience of trudging hour after hour in the silence of the desert, you're also very aware, at least I was, of walking in the footsteps of our prophets. I mean, and it's not exaggerating. It's not just, oh, this must be what the children of Israel experienced. No, these are the hills the children of Israel walked through. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and when you're in the Judean desert near Jerusalem, these are the hills to which King David fled being pursued by King Saul. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that that you literally are walking in the footsteps in, in, in the footsteps of our forefathers. Um, so the beauty of the desert may be something that one could find in the Mojave Desert in the south of uh, of California, but um, they're also ending up end up being, I think, distinctive features of dry creek beds um, with just stunning ravines, little literally uh, mini Grand Canyons. Um, and then, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry to refer again to the JNF because then you come across a reservoir that was built by the JNF in the middle of the desert with a lake near Yerucham. And you're like, uh, um, you're like where, where does this come from? Um, or down in Sapir on the, in the Arava. Um, and that's a, a really different experience. The second thing I would, I would mention is just as one example, because it happens all over the place, in the hills walking up, uh, ascending to Jerusalem, the Israel Trail takes you along what's called the Roman Road. Now, it's a beautiful forest. So the physical beauty is, is it's a pine tree forest and the scents and the birds and the, and the greenery and the, and the lush uh, hillsides, the wheat fields you walk through are just, are, are just stunning, just 
I had to stop myself from taking pictures literally every five minutes because I was both running out of battery in my camera and also, you know, wanted to focus on the enjoyment of the moment. But then all of a sudden you come across steps that were built in the very steep incline to Jerusalem carved in the side of the stone in order to enable the Roman legions to more successfully climb up to carry out their siege on Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And there's a picture that I put uh, on, my, on my website. I don't even remember if it's in the book where I kind of made a face, a selfie next to the Roman road and kind of with the feeling like, you know, we're here now and where are the Romans? They're no longer here. The old Mark Twain uh, quote about, you know, they, they rose, made a big noise and disappeared and the, and the Jews are, are, are still here. And so the historical element and the archeological element of hiking is just as important as the, as the scenery itself. Um, and in fact, that's a good segue into talking about the North because the Galilee in the North, and this is true for Christians or Muslims or Jews who have a connection to our heritage, irrespective of how religiously observant uh, you may or may not be, um, to come across the, the ancient city of Tsipori in the Galilee as another example of combining beautiful physical, the hills of the Northern Galilee, the Central Galilee are just stunningly beautiful, reminding me sometimes of, of Switzerland, a little Switzerland of uh, uh, trees and valleys. Um, but then coming across the, what was basically a metropolis at Sipuri, 30,000 people living in the largest town in the land of Israel at the time, which was a thriving, not just metropolis, but a diverse community of early Christians and Jews and pagans and others where you could tell, archaeologists share with us, you could tell which were the buildings that were inhabited by the Jewish people, which were not, uh, partially because the Jews had mikvahs, had ritual baths in their basements, which is, you know, yeah, and you're walking through this and you've got this physical beauty around you, watching the sunset across, uh, over, over uh, setting in the Mediterranean and walking again in the footsteps of the Talmudical sages who were there 2,000 years ago, um, which kind of gives you hope for the, possibilities of both the, the renewed sovereignty that we've established here, but also the coexistence that existed then that, that we hope to achieve now, obviously, in our, in our present day. So, Aria, I love what you said, is that it's not just the physical beauty, but it's the historical reference and the historical importance of what you're seeing, which happens to be beautiful. It's, it's the two combined together. Yeah, it really is. It makes it I mean, I, as I said, growing up in California, I did a lot of hiking. I'd never done this kind of a trek, by the way. I've done day hikes or one or two night overnight backpacks, but um, this kind of a trek I had never done before. But there's no question that the, the physical beauty is something that's, that's stunning, but it's a much deeper experience when you're hiking in the, in the forests of the north of Israel than when you're hiking in the forests of the of uh, the, the Sierras. And presumably one can very easily get on and off of the trail. In other words, if you want to just go on for three hours, if you have an afternoon free, in other words, you don't have to do the whole 800 mile shot. I'm so glad that you said that because that's something that I always insist that people understand. Anybody who comes to visit Israel, and please God, after Corona, after COVID uh, makes its way through and beyond us, um, obviously tourists will be returning, they are now, I always encourage people to literally get off the beaten track, even in the, in the uh, areas near Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, you can find a section of the Israel Trail um, and take a walk for three hours. And you don't have to be a, uh, an accomplished hiker. Obviously there are hard, uh, more difficult uh, sections of the trail, but uh, the ones that are accessible to, to a tourist for a half a day, or as you said, for three hours, it's such a different feel, whether it's in Sataf, which is a, a national park right outside of Jerusalem, where there is a reconstruction, reenactment of biblical era farming techniques and springs and pools, um, or whether it's the, the Yarkon Park and beyond it to the sources of the Yarkon Park right outside of Tel Aviv, um, beautiful walking paths. You wouldn't believe that you're literally 20 minutes outside of the northern sections of Tel Aviv when you're wandering on this this kind of uh, river creek that snakes through uh, literally wild areas of, uh, of green growth and trees and brush. Unbelievable. Listen, I've got my, uh, my plans now for after COVID and we can all start <laughs> traveling again. You've really whetted my appetite there. Wonderful. Ari, 
Listen, before we move on to Gigawatt Global and uh, some other work that you've done, just a couple logistical questions. So you yeah. had this pack on your back, presumably by the end of the 800 miles, you were super fit. I don't know how much weight you must have lost, but what were some <laughs> of the logistics of it? I mean, did you bring your own food? Is there food along the way? Did you stop at restaurants? Did you camp every night yourself? How did that whole thing work? Well, first of all, I have to say, I, you, it's funny you said about losing weight. I was going to patent something new called the Israel Trail Diet, because I lost eight kilos, one for each week. And what's that? That's uh, 20 pounds? Yeah, something uh, whatever. like that. Yeah. So, um, yes, it was a, a real challenge physically. And I was in decent shape before the, the, the hike, because I'm an avid biker. So I do a lot of biking. But uh, I really wasn't prepared for the physical challenge of the, uh, the 12 to 15 miles a day and with a 50 pound pack on my back. I don't know if I mentioned that. I think I did. Um, but uh, the, the logistics are a little bit complicated in the South in the desert. Um, so you mentioned water and food. So yeah, I had to pack five liters uh, of water every day. And there were times when you can't um, replenish your water. So you have to bury water in the ground in a hiding place or pay somebody a desert, uh, a desert tour company to bury it for you, to guarantee that you'll have water to restock, to replenish. Um, Wait, food so I you can... said you said to bury the water? Yes. Know, in other words, you go to a specific spot and there's water there for you? Well, so I buried myself uh, um, three in three different places because they were accessible to me in a car on my way down to a lot when I started out. Um, and there were three different places that I paid a desert tour company where they guarantee they have a spot where they hide water and they guarantee that there will be water there for you um, so that you can replenish uh, when you get to that night camp. And they, it's kind of like a James Bond uh, spy thing. Walk 100 meters past the small tree, turn left at the large green rock and under the bush on your right, you'll see the water. It's like the amazing race. <laughs> I guess so. Although right. the funny thing was, there were, there were two separate situations where the water wasn't there. And that's frightening because it's literally a matter of life and death. You, that you have to have water for the next day in the desert. And the, uh, one, one time I found other hikers that had enough water to share with me. And another time, the desert tour company, true to their word, and that's why you pay them much more than you would pay for six meters of water in a supermarket. They came out at two in the morning. I had to hike up 45 minutes to the top of a hill to get phone reception to call them to say, I went to the spot you said the water was and all there are there are empty bottles. And they came out at two in the morning and left uh, six liters of water and a candy bar outside my tent. Um, so yeah, I slept outside, you asked about that. I slept outside in the field about uh, two thirds of the time. I had a tent with me, it rained uh, a couple of times in the desert, funny enough, and a few times in the Jerusalem Hills. Um, and uh, I did carry my food with me and replenished every two or three days. You know very well, Stephen, that, that Israel is a relatively small country. So it's not like you know, you're, you're uh, in some trek and literally uh, days hiking away from civilization, but you can be a day's hike or six hours hike away from the nearest uh, um, town or village or, or um, or gas stations. So you do have to plan accordingly. And I, I either buried or bought resupplies every two or three days. Um, and so water was obviously more difficult because it's heavier. I could carry two or three days worth of food. I'm a vegetarian, ate a lot of quinoa, quinoa uh, and a lot of oatmeal and a lot of uh, granola bars uh, and Snickers too. Um, and uh, um, yet the, the, um, the real unique element of the uh, of the Israel Trail, which you can't you can't talk about it without mentioning this, um, is something called it, um, Trail Angels, which when I say unique, I mean it is distinctive. There is no other trek in the world that boasts this phenomenon. And what is it? It's private individuals or sometimes groups like a, uh, a pre, uh, pre-IDF uh, um, what's called a mechina, a preparatory program for um, post high school before IDF service uh, young people, or kibbutz or a moshav that will put a room aside, but usually it's private individuals who host through hikers on the shvil, what are called shvilistim. Uh, shvil is uh, Hebrew for path or trail, and 
the Israel Trail is called Shvil Yisrael. And so Shvilistim or Israel Trail hikers are hosted in private homes, um, given a bed, a shower, often food. Um, and you, you can't imagine. And that's why I say it's unique. And it goes back to what we were talking about, about Israel and the people of Israel as much more than just a national identity, but, but really a, a kind of a, a tribe, a clan, a family, a family. Yeah. a family is that people open their homes. I mean, I had situations where, where people would say, sorry, we're going out that night. We'll leave a key for you under the mat. You know, perfect strangers come, you have a shower, they'll give you breakfast, they'll take you back to the trailhead if they're not actually near enough to the trail just to hike out. And some of them are, are, are just really interesting. I describe in my book, one uh, in Arad, uh, Arye Schiff and his wife, Leah, who unfortunately lost their son, who was an avid hiker. And in his memory, they built like a Bedouin tent in their backyard with an outdoor shower and, uh, and toilet facility for hikers to come stay. And they take pictures with each one that comes through and, and have a book that you write in. And, uh, and they're all, I mean, I, I won't, I won't go on and on, but there are other amazing stories about the trail angels um, that, that make hiking the trail um, just incredibly special. Again, different than, uh, than other treks in the world. Well, you just said that you lost, what, 8 kg? <laughs> yeah. Right during this experience. I mean, yeah. for those of us that put on weight during COVID, listen, this is a great way <laughs> to get right. rid of it is to take to take the trail. But jokes, right. as, but jokes aside, actually, I, I just love the inspiration that you've shared for those of us that love to travel, that like to go a little bit off the beaten path, even mm -hmm. as you said, as we've said, for just a couple of hours to get a bit of a different perspective. Yeah. So definitely something to add to our travel to do list. So thank you for that. I do want to move on though and talk about Gigawatt Global because we had Yossi mm -hmm. Abramowitz here on the program. I had the good fortune of visiting Yossi in his office. Uh, let's see, that was in February of 2019 when we were yeah. in Israel doing a whole bunch of interviews. And wow. so we had such a wonderful conversation about his work with <laughs> solar energy through Africa. And I want you to talk about Gigawatt Global and about the work of the company, your mission, and also in particular about what you're doing in Africa and how that relates to Zionism. Oh, I, I would be delighted. And in fact, you may not realize this, but there's a connection also to uh, my hike and to the book, because um, as you know, I describe in the book a number of lessons that I learned on the hike from the physical hike, which helped me to, to heal, uh, to move beyond my divorce and, and, and move on with my life. Um, but one of those lessons was, uh, was related to having a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. Uh, in my life. And one of the decisions that I took in the last week of the, of the trail, and I talk about this in the book, I mentioned Yosef in the book. Yosef and I have been friends for 20 years. At that time, it was maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, and one of the decisions that I took was it was time for me to take my 30 years of business experience and to move beyond. I had helped Yosef in the beginning of setting up Gigawatt Global, which is a renewable energy platform for Africa, bringing solar electricity, building fields, in Africa. And I'd help Yosef a bit with the original setting up of the company, some strategic business planning and what have you. That was my background in business. Um, and I made the decision in the last week of the trail that I wanted to get more into that, that I wanted to bring some more meaning into my life instead of working to in increase shareholder value. Well, not instead, because we're a company and we do want to, uh, to give value to our investors. Um, but in addition to increasing shareholder value, I wanted to to try and contribute something to the world. And so I, I joined with Yosef almost immediately after the trail, much more formally, first as a consultant, and then a year or two later as a member of the executive management team of the company. Um, and I'm responsible for our strategic business planning and raising our investment funds that basically is enabling us uh, to, to build out a whole pipeline of solar and now wind projects across Africa. We just built, literally, we just finished a few months ago, our second field in Africa, our first was in Rwanda uh, in 2014, and it took a good five years. And we finally now have just completed building uh, our second field in Africa, our third overall. In Where Burundi, is it? In Burundi. Okay. And uh, for you or your listeners or our viewers um, who aren't familiar with necessarily the whole continent of Africa, Burundi is one of the poorest countries on the planet. It vies with, uh, with um, Congo and, and Burma every well, our year. 
Well, that. Arie, I should tell you, I've been to both Rwanda and Burundi. So, so, you... so I know. And Burundi is actually, a, physically, it's a beautiful country, as is yes, Rwanda. Is. Yes, yeah. very, very much so. And so yeah. you're more familiar probably than most with just how poor and, and, and how difficult um, uh, life is in, in Burundi. And we are very proud of, of our ability to succeed there because in what basically is almost as a dysfunctional state, after their civil war and, a, and a, a very challenging environment, we were successful, uh, able to build our field there to bring international financial partners, including the American government, Dutch Development Bank and others to, uh, to build a project there. And therefore it really proves our ability to replicate this, the success that we had in Rwanda. And our pipeline of projects now includes, um, in fact, it doesn't just include, our focus is on the most difficult emerging markets in the continent, Liberia, Ethiopia, South Sudan, one of the world's newest nations, uh, Nigeria, uh, Guinea, Mozambique, uh, and Zambia, where our first uh, hybrid wind and solar project is, is being developed. We're very excited about uh, the, the pipeline of projects we have now that are, that are in advanced stages of development. And that's why uh, it's, uh, it's actually, even with Corona, with COVID, uh, delaying things slightly here and there, um, we've been very, very successful now in moving ahead with uh, our planned first institutional round of funding. Um, right now we're raising, just by the way, for our listeners and our viewers, um, we're raising our last uh, friends and family round uh, of, uh, of investment um, in the next uh, four to six weeks before we move to our, our Series A institutional round. If there's anybody who who is interested in Israel and Africa and the nexus between Israel and Africa and African economic development and the humanitarian goals uh, and, and good that we, uh, that we pursue, in addition to obviously making an investment that, uh, that will, uh, will have a decent return as well. By, by the way, how do you select the countries in which you're uh, operating in? We have a rigorous uh, um, evaluation process uh, where we do... Um, uh, a lot of research into the, the country itself, the economic stability of the country, the um, ability that we will have to do business in the country. We obviously study uh, the electrical grid and its capacity. We study environmental uh, uh, and social impact uh, issues. We look for countries where the public utility, uh, the energy ministry, the finance ministry, the government itself, um, it has a proven ability to keep their word uh, we don't uh, have any truck with corruption, which means that there are countries in Africa that we refuse to do business with. Uh, we're very clear about that, not just because that's the law, American and British law, that we obviously don't just have to abide by, but we're proud to do so. You want to hear something interesting about the Israel and, and Africa uh, nexus? Um, a, uh, a, an experience that we've had a number of times is uh, uh, when a leader of an African country, even a Muslim majority, African country says to us, they want to do business with us because we're an Israeli company. And we say, you know, why is that? Because you're going to get flack. By the way, we're not an Israeli company. I misspoke just there. We're a Dutch company, which makes it convenient for these kind of situations if there is flack to be taken, because the minister can say, we're, we're dealing with a Dutch company. They built in Rwanda. They built in uh, in Burundi, also in the United States of America. So what's your problem? The fact that our headquarters is here in Jerusalem and that that, that 90 percent of our staff are, are Israelis, Israelis, Israeli Americans, or what have you, uh, is something that they celebrate. And this is the point that th this has happened, where ministers have said, "Look, you know, we, there there are countries that we would prefer to do business with. We don't really want to work with the Europeans because of all the colonial history and stuff. We don't trust the Chinese. We don't really want to work with them. We're not interested in in like, okay, Americans are good, but they're kind of in it for a buck. We want to work with you, Israelis. Why? Because we can trust you." because we know that we can rely on your word, because you guys have the best technology, because you understand security. But it all comes around then again to that trust issue. It's almost a philo-Semitism, uh, kind of looking at us as Israelis as for some reason, more moral, um, more reliable than others in the business world. And I'm not one to say that that's any more true than, the, than it is less true, but it's a fact that we've heard that before, that there's a desire to work with us as Israelis. And what I just said about Chinese, Americans, Europeans, that, that, those are direct quotes. I'm not giving them any more or less credence 
than, uh, than, than they deserve. But that is the reality. There's an interest in Africa in working with Israel in spite of the last 30 years of uh, supposed animosity and obviously uh, propaganda that's, that's been encouraging the third world uh, and, and non-aligned nations to, to try and separate from, from Israel. And Arye, talk about this connection between Zionism and Africa. Well, there's so many different connections. I mean, you can start with the issue of uh, a relationship between King Solomon and the, and the Queen of Sheba. I mean, the, the, the Ethiopian-Israel connection that goes back three and a half thousand years. Um, but there are, of course, many, many more connections, whether it's uh, Golda Meir started in the 1950s, a policy that the Israeli government has, uh, has continued, which, of course, you're familiar with, which the JNF is involved with, in terms of giving aid especially in agricultural technology, um, to African nations. Uh, the Arava Institute, which of course you're familiar with, the JNF, um, is part of, of the programs in Mashav, the, the, the uh, section of the Israeli foreign ministry that provides training, technical and scientific and agricultural training to African leaders or mid-level managers to, uh, to help boost their economies. Um, the, the truth is that the the world looks to Israel for our technology innovation, but the African nations look to Israel for much more than that because they see us as a, first of all, this issue of the indigenous people coming and, and throwing off the yokes of foreign uh, uh, colonializers, whether they're Arabs or Byzantines or Romans or what have you, uh, is, a, is an inspiring story to most of Africa with, uh, with their colonial history. Um, on top of that, the struggling uh, in the early years of the nation, which led to, uh, which, which en ended up in the economic miracle and, and security um, strength that Israel has is, is obviously something that African nations are interested in emulating. Yeah, and also don't forget Theodore Herzl, who was a big proponent of the Jewish people helping the peoples of Africa to decolonialize. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, their, uh, and their right to self-determination. Yes, precisely. Right, indeed. Listen, just a couple other bases before we push off. So you were a former senior advisor to Natan Sharansky in Israel's mm. prime minister's office. Lessons you learned from him, what was that experience like for you? I have yet to meet him, and he's very high on my list of people to meet and to interview. But what was that experience like for you, and what did you take away from your daily interactions with him? Wow. What a question. You definitely have achieved your goal of asking questions that others, that others don't ask. Um, Natan uh, is a hero, a hero of the Jewish people. But like so many others, I know I never met Ali Giso but I have a number of friends who worked closely with him. Uh, and I think there are others I'm sure that this applies to, but Nathan is a very down to earth person, even though he has an inner strength, which I don't think is rivaled by, uh, by the, most, the, the strongest Olympic athlete, boxer or, or football player. I mean, you know, to lie down in the snow in front of the KGB and refuse to move um, when they're transferring him from the affordable prison to, to the Gulag because they took away his book of Psalms, which Avital, I gave him. I mean, that, that's just, you know, there, there's the inner strength there is something that, that we all marvel at. Um, but he's also a very modest individual. And I think that if I had to, and this is off the cuff, I, I don't have a prepared answer. If I had to, to delineate two lessons I've learned from, from Natan over the 20 years that I've known him, um, one is that, that modesty, that, that sense of humility, the understanding that um, you know, I, I actually talk about this in the book, but not connected to, to Natan, but I'm connecting it now that, you know, our sages, there's a, there's a sage in the Gemara, in the Talmud, who um, apparently is said to have walked with, with two pieces of paper in his pocket, one on the right, which is a quote from Genesis saying, man was created, humanity was created in the image of God, and the other, um, uh, also from Genesis saying that humanity, mankind, men and women were created uh, out of the dust of the earth. And this balance between a, an understanding of how great and, and holy and precious uh, we are as, as human beings, balanced by the fact that we are not the center of the universe. Um, and I learned that from Natan many times in many, many different ways. Um, I mean, whether it was carrying his own bags or, or refusing different honors that, were, that, that, that people wanted to shower on him. But the second uh, I think even more profound lesson that I learned from him was his pragmatism. 
I worked with him in a political party in uh, one of the most divisive political um, uh, scenes, political environments in the world. Uh, over the course of years of both Oslo and the disengagement um, up to the, the present day. And, and Nathan always had the ability to look pragmatically as a moderate, as a centrist, at the real challenges facing Israel. He had the modesty to recognize that we can't solve everything or achieve everything that we might want to. And he had this pragmatism to say, okay, we need to deal with this issue because it's existential. And we need to find a middle ground that we all can live with even if it's not going to be perfect or what we all in our own individual ideologies, you know, had wanted. And, and he proved that time and again. I mean, one of the best examples is now it's coming back into the news, the issue of reform, conservative, non-Orthodox uh, um, streams of Judaism having a place to have their, their prayer services at the, at the Western Wall, at the Koto. Um, and he, had, he led the commission that came up with a very, pragmatic approach, which is now finally, after a decade, being implemented by the government of Israel. And he had the same kind of centrist and moderate and pragmatic approach to so many things. I won't, delete, I won't, I won't list them. You know what they are, all of the existential issues that, that Israel deals with on a social or cultural or religious level, or even our security issues. He, he always found that middle path um, to, to figure out what was a reasonable um, realistic solution to whatever the challenge is that reasonable people could agree with, even if the the ideologues at the at the fringes of society, you know, might might book. And I definitely learned that from him. Beautiful. Well, listen, Arye, I can't have you on the program without asking you about your grape growing and your winemaking. <laughs> I think you're the second guest that is a winemaker. We had Ellie Wertman, who you oh, may know, I know. Who, I know yes, right who, who's also a winemaker. And so talk about your growing your grapes, what kind of grapes, what kind of wine. <laughs> I have to say, by the way, Ellie, who is a friend who I've known for years. Ellie we'll send him our best regards. We love oh, having him do. on the program, sure. I'm very glad. In fact, his office is literally just uh, four offices over from mine here. Is uh, that right? In, in Jerusalem, yeah. Um, but Ellie, uh, Ellie and his partner, Jacob Ner David were the owners uh, and the, the funders of one of the first companies that I was a consultant to in Jerusalem about 25 years ago. Uh, so we've known each other for quite a while. Yaakov, Jacob, uh, actually um, is the owner of the Jezreel Winery, which I actually invested in. Uh, invested in. Um, so I'm a partner, one could say there. And Ellie owns, of course, his winery. But I have to admit that I am allowed to claim something that neither of them can, which is that as a hobby, I actually grow grapes and make wine myself. I don't just own a winery, um, but I, it's, a, it's a hobby. I only make 150, 200 bottles a year. But I've done is, Ar is, is Arie stomping on the grapes? <laughs> oh, yes. You know it. Um, so where, are you, where, are you, where, are you growing, where are you growing the grapes? So I live in Beit Shemesh, and I have a small vineyard in my backyard. Um, and I make about 70 or, or, or 80 bottles out of the 21 vines that are in my backyard every year. It's Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, they've grown there for about 20 years. And in that time, I also make wine from grapes that I buy from Harbracha or Carmel Yosef or other vineyards, uh, and their grapes are different. Um, and it, there's no question that making your own wine as a hobby is something that's phenomenal. It's phenomenally enjoyable when the wine comes out good. It's phenomenally frustrating when you make 150 bottles of wine and find two years later after bottling them and aging them that they're all vinegar because something went wrong. <laughs> that doesn't happen with, with, with professional uh, uh, wineries. But um, Do you have a label or is it just sort of yes. a house brand? What is the name of the well, label? It, it is a house brand. It's called Greenhouse Cellars. Uh, I don't, I don't sell it. It's not for sale in any store. Is that, or is that but, C E it's a seller as in a basement seller, not a seller right. as a buyer seller. That's right. And okay. in Hebrew, it's Martefei Bait Hayarok, which is bad Hebrew, ungrammatical, but I had to use it that way because the whole point of the play on words of greenhouse in terms of greenhouse sellers, because it comes from literally, we make it in my basement. Um, I had to, to play with the Hebrew a bit, but I do have uh, a good 150, 200 bottles to give away every year. Um, and so if any of our listeners or, or viewers make their way to Israel, 
and let's use this as an incentive to hike the Israel Trail. If you come, and Stephen, you said you're going to next time. So when you come to Israel and you decide to take three hours to hike the Israel Trail, let me know. I would happily join you. And we can end by sitting on my balcony in Beit Shemesh and watching the sunset, drinking some greenhouse cellars, or I'll just give you a bottle if you can't make it to Beit Shemesh. Listen, Arye, that is incentive enough to make it to Israel on the first flight that I can make it to Israel on. So on that optimistic note, we're going to leave it right there. This has been such an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. And we just want to thank you so much, truly, for joining us here on Israel Cast. And we want to remind our listeners that once again, the book is My Israel Trail, Finding Peace in the Promised Land. We'll have a link to that and all things REA Green on the show notes page of our website, jnf.org slash IsraelCast. And really, before we move on with some housekeeping, I'd like to remind you, our dear listeners, that Jewish National Fund USA believes that time has indeed come for us to reclaim the narrative, take ownership of the word Zionism, and show the world how beautiful, inclusive, and inspirational it really is, as we've just been discussing. So do join Jewish National Fund USA's Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's a year-long series which will educate, engage, and inspire inspire on the true meaning of the word Zionism and reclaim its true meaning and in all of its glory. So go to jnf.org slash convos for more. All right. And of course, we do release new episodes of Israel Cast every other Wednesday. And just so you never miss an episode, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Simply search for Israel Cast. Don't forget to rate and review us as well to make it easier for more folks around the world to find us. Or you can always enjoy the show by visiting us at our website, once again, it's jnf.org slash IsraelCast. Now it takes a homo shop to put IsraelCast together. And for that, we thank Vivian Grossman, Dara Shapiro, and Olivia Schendel. Our editors are Jay Rothman and James Casada from Miratone Studios in the very heart of New York City. And the music that you hear at the top and tail of the program is titled My Eden. It's by the very talented Rafi Malkiel from his album Water on the Tzadik label. Now IsraelCast is indeed powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. And for more information about JNF USA, visit jnf.org. And if you'd like to write to us with story ideas or just to say hello, we'd all love to hear from you. Our email address, jot this down, is israelcast at jnf.org. Meantime, I'm Stephen Shalowitz, thanking you for tuning in and looking forward to having you join us on future episodes of IsraelCast.